Welcome to our special edition of Bulls, Bears, and Blockchain, which is Baker Hostetler's Fireside Chat Series, where we discuss the current events related to the capital markets and their participants and the blockchain industry. So today I am thrilled to be your host for this very special event with an incredible lineup of, of guests. In light of the historic SEC Speaks event being canceled this year and the uptick in SEC's enforcement and rulemaking docket, we are hosting former SEC Speaks, featuring four former commissioners of the Securities and Exchange Commission. So first, I would like to introduce Commissioner Paul Atkin. He was a commissioner from 2002 to 2008, and he's currently the Chief Executive Officer of Potomac Global Partners, a leading financial sector consultancy. Mr. Atkins regularly serves as an independence compliance consultant, a court appointed monitor and expert witness involving federal agencies and regulators and particularly with the SEC matters. Mr. Atkins has also led industry efforts to develop best practices for digital asset issuances and trading platforms as co-chair of the Token Alliance. He served as an independent director and non-executive chairman of the Board of BATS Global Markets. He was appointed a member of the Congressional Oversight Panel for the Troubled Asset Relief Program, and he served as the Chief of Staff for SEC Chairman Richard Breeden and Counselor for SEC Chairman Arthur Levitt. Thank you so much for joining us, Commissioner Atkins. Thank you, Teresa. It's my pleasure to introduce Commissioner Dan Gallagher, uh, who is an SEC Commissioner from 2011 to 2015. He's currently the Chief Legal and Compliance and Corporate Affairs Officer of Robinhood Markets and serves on the board of NACD and advisory boards for the Institute for Law and Economics at the University of Pennsylvania and the Center for Corporate Governance in Drexel University's Laveau College of Business. He formerly served as a non-executive director of the Irish Stock Exchange and before joining Robinhood, Dan was a partner and deputy chair of the Securities department at the law firm of Wilmer Hale. He held several positions on the staff prior to being appointed commissioner, including deputy director and co-acting director of the Division of Trading and Markets, and served as the chief legal officer of Mylan uh, NV, a leading global pharmaceutical company, and as the president of a financial services consulting firm. And no introduction by me of Dan would be complete without mentioning that I first met Dan when he was a law school intern at the SEC in our group in the Enforcement Division. And I'm quite confident he's the most successful SEC law school intern ever. Uh, thanks very much, Dan, for joining our program. Love that connection, Jonathan. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, hi, I'm John Carney, and I have the pleasure of introducing Commissioner uh, Troy Parides. He was an SEC commissioner from 2008 to 2013 and is the founder of Parides Strategies, LLC, advising on financial regulation, corporate governance, compliance, and governmental regulatory affairs. He also serves as an expert and advisor in regulatory enforcement investigations and actions an independent compliance consultant and monitor, and on various advisory boards and boards of directors. He is the author of numerous academic articles and co-author of multi-volume multi securities regulation treatise. Uh, he has numerous academic appointments, including Distinguished Scholar of Residence at NYU School of Law, Lecturer of Law at Harvard Law School, Distinguished Policy Fellow and Lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, a Visiting Professor of Law at Georgetown University Law Center and UCLA School of Law, and finally, a Professor of Law at Washington University St. Louis, a Professor of Business by Courtesy at Washington University's Olin Business School. Great. Thank you. Great to be here. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Pivovar who served as acting SEC chairman in 2017 and an SEC commissioner from 2013 to 2018. He serves as executive vice president of the Milken Institute Center for Financial Markets and is a member of Georgetown University's Sorrow Center for Financial Markets and Policy Advisory Board and a program fellow at the Program in Law and Economics and Capital Markets at the Columbia Law School. Prior to his role at the SEC, he served as the Republican Chief Economist for the U.S. Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs, the lead Republican economist on the four SEC-related titles of the Dodd-Frank Act and the Jobs Act, a senior economist at the President's Council of Economic Advisors in both the George W. Bush and Barack Obama administrations during the global financial crisis and its immediate aftermath, 
a visiting academic scholar and senior, senior financial economist at the SEC and an assistant professor of finance, finance at Iowa State University. Welcome, Commissioner Pickleball. Thank you, Veronica, and thank you, Teresa, for, uh, for organizing us all to be here. Thanks. All right, so my name is Jimmy Focus, and I'm just going to take a few seconds here to briefly introduce the Baker Hostetler panelists and hosts today. Uh, four of us are alums, and many of us routinely represent companies and executives in SEC enforcement litigation. So starting with me, I'm Jimmy Focus. I'm a partner in the White Collar Group at Baker Hostetler. I also co-lead the financial investigations practice team at Baker. Prior to Baker, I served as a senior counsel in the Division of Enforcement at the SEC in the New York office. Uh, next, we have John Carney, who you heard from already. John co-leads our white collar practice. Prior to Baker, he was an assistant United States attorney in the District of New Jersey, where he was also the chief of the securities fraud unit. And before that, he was a senior counsel in the enforcement division and also a CPA at a big four accounting firm. John Barr is a member of our white collar group and also co-leader of the firm's financial investigations practice. Before Baker, John was also an assistant United States attorney uh, who served in the fraud section at Maine Justice. He is also an SEC alum, having served as senior counsel in the SEC's enforcement division in the Home Office. Uh, our host today, who you've heard from, Teresa Goody Guillen, is a member of our white collar group, also co leads our Brock blockchain practice team. In addition to that, in her, during her busy schedule, she teaches digital law and policy at Georgetown and was formerly in the SEC's office of the general counsel. Michelle Tanny is a partner in our white collar group in New York. Before Baker, she was a member of the Government Relations and Regulatory Affairs Department at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And last but certainly not least, Ver Veronica Reynolds. She's a member of our Digital Assets and Data Management Group and also a key member of our blockchain team. Veronica frequently lectures at various law schools on digital assets. Teresa? Yeah, so thank you, everyone. I am so pleased to be with he you here today. And to kick off this special event, um, commissioners, thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. We are really honored to have you here. Um, so I'm excited for our first topic, which is our app title for former SEC Speaks. Um, so to put this conversation in context, um, we just want to talk about a little bit about the history and the background of SEC Speaks and what goes along with it. Um, so SEC Speaks was launched in 1972. A lot of people don't know that it was actually launched before the creation of the SEC's Enforcement Division. And it's hosted by a nonprofit legal educational organization, Practicing Law Institute. And according to Chairman Harvey Pitt, it was conceived by Al Summer, Alan Levinson, and PLI's Mary Ewell. John, move it over to you. You're on mute. Sorry about that, trying to be make sure I keep it quiet. The program has historically been regarded as an important venue for the commission to discuss important developments and exchange ideas with the private sector. At the second SEC Speaks, Chairman Designate uh, Bradford Cook referred to the conference uh, SEC Speaks as quote unquote vital. At the inaugural 1972 SEC Speaks, Chairman William Casey discussed the importance of the conference and that the SEC requires an open door approach to, pra to practically and effectively regulating the capital markets. In conjunction with SEC Speaks, the Association of Securities and Exchange Commission alumni, ASECA, holds its annual dinner where it presents the William O. Douglas Award to recognize outstanding SEC alums, as well as scholarship awards for people aspiring to careers at the SEC or to members of the SEC support staff. It's always been a significant opportunity for alumni to show support for the agency and its mission. And so in, in February 2023, the Wall Street Journal quoted an SEC official who explained that the cancellation of, you know, what's really historic, been a historic program, SEC Speaks, was due to two things. Uh, one, the lack of time the agency could devote to this year's event. Um, and two, concern about giving the appearance that private lawyers can pay to access senior agency staff. As a consequence, the ASICA dinner that John just talked about um, and the award ceremony was postponed. So commissioners, for first question, um, what are your thoughts on the cancellation of, of this year's SEC Speaks? Well, I can, I can uh, start uh, maybe, but again, thank you all for uh, having uh, having me and the rest of us here, I think, uh, look forward to the discussion. Uh, I mean, I guess, uh, you know, 
what can one say? I'm, uh, you know, disappointed in it, and I think it's too bad. Uh, you know, I, so first I'm on the Aseka board, so I'm not speaking for any other board member or I've floated you know, this question by anybody or whatever. So, uh, but um, I just joined this year, so um, I was looking forward uh, to the event. Uh, so, you know, I guess the one thing that I, I should say is that it's uh, really uh, too bad because, as you pointed out, uh, there are two not-for-profits that uh, basically run this, PLI the foremost, and then, of course, the um, alumni dinner kind of tags along because there's so many people historically who have come to Washington uh, just for the uh, the conference. And now that's fallen off a little bit because of COVID. And, and then of course it's uh, one can uh, watch from one's office and, and it's still multitask or whatever, but still a lot of people come because they wanna see old friends and colleagues and, and stay connected that way. So uh, going back to the, the precipitous, I would call it cancellation, because there was maybe six weeks left. Uh, you know, the, uh, the the financial penalties, um, you know, are um, you know potentially pretty significant on these uh, not for profits, but especially PLI. Um, so that's uh, that's the main thing, and I'm not really sure. I uh, you know, I mean, those those two, if those be the uh, the real. Um, uh, you know, reasons for the cancellation, uh, you know, it was not a surprise. It could have been decided um, much earlier. And um, so that's, uh, you know, and certainly the the second uh, rationale was floated uh, has been true since the beginning. And I know I considered that when I was a commissioner as to whether I should even participate uh, in it. And I know, um, you know, at least one other commissioner has uh, uh, done the same. So, um, but still I got, you know, I think there's a lot of salutary benefits, of course, to have a conference like this. Uh, and again, you know, it's uh, as far as preparation goes, this you have panels uh, from the various divisions, and this is what they do for their day job. And it's not like they're enunciating new policies, uh, um, you know, in a forum like that. It's really to kind of go over what they've been doing um, over the past year with uh, maybe other public, you know, kind of summarizing other public things, uh, you know, what would be going on in the future. So anyway, I, I think it's too bad. I just, I think it uh, uh, shows an uh, isolation and insulation of the uh, commission from, uh, uh, you know, interaction with the public. And I think that's, uh, you know, for the worse. Commissioner Pilhar, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I mean, I, I, Paul used the word disappointed, and I would say that that's that was my reaction too. Um, I, I'd say disappointed, but not surprised. Um, I mean, I, if you look at the current commission and you know a lot of the a lot of the norms that have been carried through prior commissions have not been carried through on this one. Um, so at the beginning, when um, when the commission uh, fired all of the public company accounting oversight board members, PCOB members, um, even though they had not completed their terms, that had never been for, before been done. It's legal, but it was just a norm that we had um, to let those people continue and continue their work. Uh, a second norm is, you know, when, when senior staff leaves the SEC, there's often a press release um, touting uh, all the work that they had done on behalf of taxpayers as a way to sort of congratulate them. Uh, it's been publicly reported that, that this commission is, um, is suppressing those press releases to cover up the fact that there has been so much turnover by senior staff uh, at the commission. So when this was finally announced that you know they had uh, canceled SEC speaks, um, you know it's just another norm that um, that you know in, in in the long list of things that the commission's doing. Uh, to Paul's point about the concern about giving up staff to uh, uh, you know a private agency, that was one when I came into the commission, not being a lawyer myself, I came. Well, what is this PLI? Um, and, uh, you know, I remember actually calling up Paul and, uh, and asking him about uh, how he got comfortable with it. And, um, and in my first speech at SEC Speaks, you know, I pointed out the fact that, you know, look, we could make these, we could easily cure that by making um, the webcast available for free uh, for people after the conference. And the other thing is, you know, as Paul's point, they, they, don't, they don't really do new policy there. And in the speeches that the commissioners give are also put up on the website anyway and publicly available. So, uh, and there's a lot of reporters there uh, who cover a lot of, of that stuff. You know, and the first concern about giving up staff, 
um, you know, it's, it's incredibly valuable as a place, not only for the SEC to speak, but also to listen, um, you know, with the SECA dinner um, uh, and with the networking that goes on there, it's a way for current staff and current commissioners to get the benefit of the alumni who's maybe seen a lot of these issues before um, and in a very informal you know, uh, setting and everybody's kind of together on these things. So, so it's really a shame. Again, you know, disappointed, but not surprised. Commissioner Gallagher, what do you think? Yeah, just uh, you know, echo a lot of what's already been said and um, to pick up on uh, what Mike just said as far as sort of the, the continuity and tradition of things, it's, it's easy to forget these things, right? If you don't have interaction with folks that worked at the agency, whether on the commission or the staff in the past. And you know, it was one thing when I was on the commission I found incredibly useful was to sit down with former commissioners, former chairman, I mean, Harvey more than most, because uh, he could walk you all the way back, you know, to the, the early 70s forward. And what you learn very quickly is nothing is new, right? The commission's been through the same old issues and different flavors since its inception. Um, and it's useful to learn about the history of how prior commissions dealt with similar or even sometimes the same issue. Um, and I think it gives you a renewed respect for the prior work or new respect, I guess, for some folks who aren't familiar with it, um, of the prior commissions. And, you know, the, you know, we've heard for now years, the commission's become a more and more political place. And, um, you know, I'm not going to disagree with that. And I think, right, that it, it can only help sort of temper that political fever sometimes when you're looking back at history, you're looking at how other uh, commissions handled issues and did so really with an eye towards investors at the end of the day. And, and the agency itself and not the politics of the day. So I think it's um, it's a shame from that perspective because it's just one more opportunity uh, that we have to, to interact with um, you know, fellow alums. And I, I think that's good for everybody. I think it's it's good for investors. It, it kind of relates almost back to the, um, the old revolving door debates that, that get uh, you know, brought up every two or three years uh, with respect to the agency, right? To have folks who, in my view, to have folks who are steeped in the securities laws, who know how the agency proceeds, knows what the agency expects uh, from market participants, to have them out there in the markets as deputies to, to provide good advice, like you guys do for, for your clients, right? It's a good thing for the markets generally. Um, and you know, part of that process is staying in the loop and staying connected with, um, with folks who've also been there. So anyway, it's, a, it's, it's regrettable. Uh, hopefully we can get it back on track. Mr. Paredes, how about you? What do you think? As, as a general matter, I think the more opportunity there is for folks at the commission and across government more broadly, not just at the SEC and not just even in financial services, to interact with a wide set of constituents is better. Um, I think not only in terms of sharing what the priorities are and, and as others have said, sharing what the commission has been up to in you know, recent months or years, that's important, but also the opportunity to have the interaction beyond that, the opportunity to share a perspective, the opportunity to share not just what you're doing, but the why you're doing it just as a general proposition, I think is important and I think is a positive, not only for the marketplace writ large, but also for the regulator, in this case, of course, being, being the SEC. And to a point that Dan was making and, and, and Mike as well, uh, and Paul too, there is an incredibly rich tradition at the SEC. And that's not just in terms of the agency as such and how it does what it does. And there's always opportunity to improve. And just because you did something doesn't mean you should always continue to do something. You should do the best you can and look for those opportunities to continue to improve. But there's also a rich tradition and a trajectory in terms of how the federal securities laws have developed since 1933. And I think that's important as well. One of the lessons when you when you study the history of the federal securities and the SEC is things tend to be done in a somewhat incremental fashion instead of trying to do everything all at once. And I think even that recognition and appreciation for how jurisprudence evolves, for how regulatory requirements evolve, for how there's opportunity for new thinking as facts and circumstances on the ground evolve, I do think in subtle ways, the more you interact, the more you get a sense and a feel for that because you're having the chance to share perspectives with folks who maybe 30 years ago were part of that initial rulemaking that 
you know, the commission may be thinking of taking up now or that may be top of folks' minds. So I think that kind of richness of the understanding of the agency and how it does what it does and how the federal securities laws and the regulatory regime has developed over the decades at this point, I think any opportunity uh, to foster that, I think is a good thing. So look, I think it's pretty unanimous here from, from our panelists and you know, even your, your Baker Hostel hosts all tend to agree that hopefully the SEC is listening and this was a one-year aberration and we'll, we'll, we'll be back at SEC Speaks next year and at the ASICA dinner uh, doing what, what's been done for many, many years. Um, with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Teresa and Veronica, who are now going to discuss uh, something that's somewhat in the press these days, which is the SEC's enforcement and regulation of digital assets. Teresa. Yeah, so thanks, Jimmy. Um, and so crypto has been a very hot topic, especially with the Ripple decision last week, which we'd love to get your thoughts on. Um, and just generally the uh, a lot of a lot of industry and commentators have been noting the aggressive approach of regulating the digital asset industry by the SEC um, and some confusion so we have the CFTC saying many assets are commodities the CF, the SEC saying or the SEC chair rather saying that most digital assets are securities and then the two agencies asserting jurisdiction over the same asset sometimes in competing enforcement cases claiming one is a one, one agency says it's a security and the other agency says that exact same asset is a commodity. Um, and there's over 15 legislative proposals on how to regulate the industry. And Chair Gensler um, has said that the rules of the road here are clear and the commission has spoken with a clear voice through the Dow report, the Munchie order and enforcement action. So with that kind of lead up, um, commissioners, we'd love to get your thoughts on, on the SEC's approach to regulation, regulation and enforcement in the digital asset industry and whether you agree with Chair Gensler about um, the regime being clear. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Teresa, since I was at the commission when we released the Dow report that, that Chairman Gensler mentioned, I'm happy to go first and sort of address that. That was, that was back in 2017 and we released this report report it was it was a that what we call 21a report a report of investigation that we did in conjunction with an enforcement case that we decided not to bring um and if you look at the facts and circumstances of that particular case it was it was very clear cut the 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 dow the distributed autonomous autonomous organization was effectively using tokens on the ethereum network um to engage in a crowdfunding crowdfunding platform. And what we said in that Dow report was that, you know, in this case, we're going to use the lens of the Howey test um, to look at, um, you know, the totality of the economic reality of those transactions. And in the case back then, on, it was in initial coin offerings, it was very clear that the Howey test was very appropriate and engaged in capital raising, whether it was for business plans or in this case, a crowdfunding platform. They used words like projects, but it was really a business plan and it conferred ownership rights and um, voting rights and all these other things. And when you look drill down into it, it was very clear that that was a security. And in the case of I would agree with Chair Gensler in the case of initial coin offerings, when it involves capital raising, the Howey test is very appropriate and very clear. Once you get away from that, as we saw in the Ripple case, and um, you asked about you know, the opinion, I'm still reading through it. I've read through it three times and I'm still trying to parse out some of the things. And, and what's clear about that is that once you start applying the Howey test to things beyond traditional capital raising, then it gets a lot more difficult. And then we get into questions in terms of how appropriate that is um, and the need for Congress uh, to step in. So happy to add more, but let me step, stop there and uh, let my other fellow panelists uh, weigh in here. Well, I, I can uh, offer a couple things, points as well. I think, uh, well, first, well, there are two things here. One is the instant case, but you also asked about, you know, the SEC's whole approach uh, to uh, digital assets. So first on the case, I think, you know, it's uh, congratulations to Judge Torres. I think, uh, I don't know her, but, uh, you know, she really put her finger on, uh, you know, a really important uh, aspect of this. You know, are we looking at, you know, the transactions or we're we looking at the asset. And I think if you look at the Howey case and then you look at, uh, you know, what is an investment contract, uh, which is, you know, the Supreme Court took a stab at it. 
back in whenever it was 1946 to figure out, okay, what does that actually mean? So they came up with a test that, um, you know, has the, the term in their expectation. Um, and so expectation of profit. And so, uh, you know, she parsed it out and applied it to, to the facts at hand, and we'll see whether or not uh, that stands scrutiny because this will be inevitably appealed, um, I'm sure. And um, uh, you know, I'm sure both sides think that they'll ultimately prevail. Um, you know, I do think that um, these sorts of questions, whether it be in Ripple or something else, will go up to the Supreme Court. Uh, and since this is all judge-made uh, rules and by the Supreme Court itself, I think they're the appropriate ones, you know, in the first instance here, since it's coming up to them, to try to clean up this mess. And then obviously Congress is there, but they're kind of dysfunctional. And so I don't really see anything immediately on the horizon. Maybe this will spur them as uh, other judges try to, um, you know, deal uh, with uh, applying, you know, these sorts of uh, this sort of tests uh, to other cases. So it'll be very interesting to see how that goes. Um, but I do think that, uh, you know, I think the, the uh, Ripple folks here have a very strong case to, uh, um, uh, you know, to, to push forward. Um, on the other side, as far as uh, just in general, how the SEC has approached all this, I think it really is, uh, you know, I said I was disappointed about SEC speaks. So I'd have to use that term again uh, here. I thought, um, you know, the, the commission in the past, if you think about how the SEC has approached uh, other issues in the marketplace, um, whether it be technology issues or whatever, um, the SEC has always accommodated new technologies and figured out uh, how to deal with them. And if you go back to the 1960s, before my time, uh, as far as the markets go, and I think probably everybody, at least on the screen here, um, you know, believe it or not, the New York Stock Exchange had to close down at least one day per week just to catch up, there's a bull market there, huge um, you know, spike in trading. And this is when you had paper certificates and you had clerks running from one investment bank to another and to the tra uh, transfer agent and whoever else to try to shuttle around these various certificates to have them uh, you know, processed and then be able to complete the transaction. Sometimes the uh, exchange had to close down for two days per week. Um, and so through all that and all the fails that uh, came up out of these transactions, um, a lot of broker dealers went out of business. They just, they couldn't, uh, uh, you know, they couldn't cover things or capital wasn't sufficient. So that spurred um, in the first instance, the SEC um, uh, dealing with, uh, you know, 15C3, three and other things to, uh, um, you know, to try to help uh, and then to also work with the industry and uh, DTCC came about with global certificates and all that. The SEC had to change its rules to uh, accommodate all those sorts of things. And then, of course, Congress got into the act with SIPA and other things to uh, you know, try to help out uh, investors in the market. So that's one thing. Back when I was uh, with Breeden, we um, uh, that's when the first, uh, basically, the first ETF came out, Spiders. Uh, and then under Arthur Levitt, uh, ATSs, and Arthur thought, you know, it shouldn't be the exchange uh, type of uh, regime that's imposed on these sorts of things that uh, so we worked on a broker dealer uh, uh, type of uh, approach um, for them. And so that stood the test of time as well. So those are just a few examples that uh, the latter ones there that I've dealt with uh, in my days of the um, SEC in and out of it, uh, where I think the SEC has accommodated uh, issues in the, in the um, market. So unfortunately here with uh, the crypto, it's, uh, um, uh, uh, marketplace of uh, the commission has been like the ostrich with the head in the sand uh just sort of ignoring what's going on not trying to figure out how to accommodate this with its rules it has plenary it has not plenary but plenty of authority um uh, you know to deal uh with this that congress has given it in the 33 and 34 and 40 acts um, but we have unfortunately not seen any creative thinking um it's always been uh you know uh just one-off uh, 
um, issues, except for, um, you know, was with the Dow case where at least the commission did a 21A report. So anyway, with that, I'll let others talk. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks. That was insightful. I'll go ahead and um, for a few a few thoughts. So without getting to all the ins and outs of the Ripple case and, and the opinion, I think one, one general point that the judge, I think, um, drives at is that, of course, as we know, if you know how we that facts and circumstances matter, it's the facts and circumstances test. So then by definition, facts and circumstances matter. But there's an aspect of, of that decision, I think, really tees that up, which is to say, you can have a particular asset, but as the facts and circumstances surrounding that asset, if you will, change, that may then change what the regulatory analysis is as to whether or not a particular arrangement is a security. That actually, just, I think, just flows logically from Howie, right? Now, if you have a facts and circumstances test, it therefore must follow that as the facts and circumstances that are relevant changes, whether or not something is an investment contract and therefore security may change. So I just think that that, that underscoring of that or seeing how that notion coming directly out of out of how we being a facts and circumstances based test is you know one aspect of of the opinion setting aside the particulars um, of the rest of the courts uh, of the court's reasoning but beyond that i think another aspect is really important so much of the discussion in the digital asset space and i think for a very good reason has been around trying to figure out what a particular asset or what a particular arrangement is is there a security? Is there a commodity? Is there a good? Is there a service? Is there a, you know, whatever else could be in the possible universe of things that something could be? And that's important for the obvious reason that depending upon what it is, and therefore depending upon the nature of the transactions with respect to that thing, that's going to have consequences as to which regulatory regime or regimes apply. And so you have that kind of threshold jurisdictional question that's front and center, and that's consequential for uh, self-evident reasons. Regardless of where all of this comes out in terms of how we or some other test or what the Second Circuit, if it's appealed or beyond that, has to say on it, the universe of digital assets that constitute securities is not going to be a null set. I mean, even the Ripple judge didn't say that none of these were securities. So that's not saying what will constitute securities. It's just to say that I think it won't be the case that nothing constitutes securities. That hasn't been the stance that um, that folks have been have been taking. The question is, is what? With that, that I think is important to, to, to lead to is, is there's still the question of what are the details of the regulatory requirements that apply? So once you get past the categorization, once you get past the jurisdictional question, there is still the, well, how do you comply question? And I think that from that perspective, much more time and effort, I think, is, is warranted. That's not a discussion around is anti-manipulation something we should be focused on? We should be focused on anti-manipulation. Is anti-fraud something we should be focused on? We should be focused on anti-fraud. Is transparency something we should be focused on? We should be. Is conflict, right? You can go through a whole list of things that kind of drive and are at the fore when it comes to the federal securities laws and regulation more broadly. Those are legitimate, I think, regulatory objectives from a regulator's perspective, as well as from the market's perspective, where the market is on firmer footing over the long term when people have confidence in it and when the market has integrity. However, the details, the details of the regulatory requirements, do folks know what those details are? Are they workable in the sense that you have an opportunity to comply if you make the time, the effort, the commitment? And coming back to, to part of what, what Paul was saying, the regulatory requirements at the level of details, in, in, in my view, need to match whatever the changes are when it comes to the underlying technology in this case. You got to have regulatory details and, term and requirements that meet the technology. That's not to be pro or anti any particular thing. It's to actually create a regulatory environment that allows the marketplace the opportunity to figure out what the use cases are and what the opportunities are and how those opportunities are going to take a, be taken advantage of. So even as we continue to work through the what is it question, I think we also need to be spending a heck of a lot of time on the, all right, how do we fashion what those regulatory requirements are at the level of the details? So wherever the what is it question lands, we can have a regulatory regime that vindicates legitimate objectives, good for regulators and good for the marketplace, good for investors, consumers, and otherwise, but are workable in ones folks understand in terms of what it's going to take to actually comply. Well, I don't want to pile on because so much good stuff was said, but. Um... 
you know, look, I just think it, in in a nutshell, it's a shame we're in this situation where not only is, is it um, truly a regulation by enforcement posture, but that's giving us these disparate uh, pieces. <laughs> you know, we're kind of collecting tea leaves here and there and trying to read them. And for folks like us here at Robinhood, we're trying to do it the right way. We're, we're trying to do it in a compliant way. We think we do. Uh, but you don't know every day you wake up and, you know, a different case comes out naming a different uh, uh, coin, a security. And, you know, that that turns it into the uh, the hot potato. Right. Once it's a security, everyone else around it needs to be registered. And um, it's quite a mess. And so, um, you know, I, I completely disagree with this notion that the existing securities laws as written accommodate this market. They just simply don't. And. And I actually got asked the question and testimony at House Ag a few weeks ago, uh, right after the Binance and, and Coinbase cases were brought. We had three of the coins named as securities on our platform at Robinhood, despite, by the way, having uh, memos from uh, a very, very top national law firm saying they're not securities. Uh, commission said they're securities. Um, and I was asked the question by uh, Congressman, well, why don't you just take those if they're securities? And you're Robin Hood, you have a big brokerage firm, just go trade them in the broker. And the answer to that was we can't. You need further regulatory relief to be able to trade even a digital asset uh, security that the commission has not given uh, that doesn't exist today. Now, I think Paul made the point, if you wanna use exemptive authority and no action relief and all sorts of other things to, to bubble gum and band-aid together a system, you could do a heck of a lot better than we're doing right now. Um, but the real answer here is legislation. And I find uh, it regrettable that the commission, you know, a majority of the commission uh, has not decided to get together and support legislation to provide clarity. It's just, it's not, not the right posture for a bunch of unelected folks to sit around and say, we, we've got this, we don't need Congress. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's true. And I think traditionally you were talking about the institutional SEC, right? Is you would see the CFTC and the SEC working together, having, discussions and coming together with Congress and kind of a more collaborative approach than what I think that we've seen here. Um, it's, called, so, it's called leadership. And I think that's what's <laughs> so, to a point. Right. <laughs> Much more articulate. Than the, <laughs> um, so we're running um, behind our time. So we'll switch over to our next topic, which is ESG. So John. John Carney, right. on me. Yes, I'm on now. I'm sorry. I was, didn't want it to go that fast. So moving on to another topic, ESG. Last year, the SEC proposed amendments that would significantly alter regulation SK and SX. Amendments would require public companies to disclose information regarding climate-related risks that are reasonably likely to have a material impact on their business or financial statements, related governance and oversight processes, greenhouse gases, et cetera. Um, there appears to be a lot of contention uh, uh, in the area, uncertainty, if you will, not only as to the timing and the scope of climate-related disclosure requirements, but also as to whether the SEC, in the first instance, has the statutory authority uh, to implement them. Um, so our, the question for our uh, panelists is, you know, what is your view on the SEC's approach to including climate and ESG uh, in reporting requirements? And let me start with Commissioner Paredes. Wow, <laughs> so no small, uh, no small question there because there's so many different aspects to it. Let, let me let me start with the the following, which is materiality, where a lot of the discussions you know start with. And what I the, the point I want to make when it comes to materiality is is not one about the definition that has been applied in the courts and how that has informed the development of the regulatory regime um, as such, but a slightly different point, um, and that is that the SEC has a particular mission that it was set up for. Um, investor protection, fairly efficient markets, facilitating you know, capital formation. At its core though, it's in the financial services space and our capital markets and at its core, when it comes to the disclosure aspects of the regulatory regime, the basic philosophy is, is as, we, as, we, as we all know, provide the marketplace with material information to make an informed investment decision and then let the marketplace decide how to allocate capital. I mean, that is, I think, at, at, at the heart of it, what the SEC um, is about, what the federal securities laws are oriented um, towards. 
So when it comes to various initiatives, like for example, ESG to the extent the SEC is in that um, space, climate proposal, for example, I think what happens is the question becomes, all right, well, what is the motivation behind what it is the SEC is looking to accomplish? Is the SEC looking to accomplish an objective that's consonant with, with its traditional mission? Or is the SEC looking to accomplish some other goal that no matter how important that goal may be, isn't consistent with what the SEC was set up to do? And that comes back, I think, to questions as to materiality. It comes back as to other questions as well. But I think when you have a lot of the discussions around ESG, a lot of the discussions around the climate uh, proposal in particular, I think what, what you find out when you pose that question to folks, you will get very different answers. Sometimes folks say that what the SEC is looking to do is address climate risk as such, which raises questions as to whether or not that actually is within the scope of the SEC's authority. Others say, look, this is material information in terms of what's necessary to make an informed decision as an investor. And so therefore, while it happens to be related to climate, this is part and parcel of what the SEC has done since its, since its founding in the, in the 30s. People have different views as to that particular um, question and what the answer is to that question when it comes to what the SEC is doing. What I would say is, is that to the extent the SEC doesn't adhere to its traditional mission, one of the concerns I have is, is that the SEC and the federal securities laws, perhaps our capital markets more broadly, start to become politicized. And I worry about that regardless of this side of the aisle or that side of the aisle or this policy preference or that policy preference. I worry about that in terms of the lack of predictability. I worry about that in terms of what it may mean in terms of the flow of capital. I worry about that in terms of what it may mean in terms of economic efforts being funded, job creation, growth opportunities. So I think there are some big picture consequences to the extent the SEC were to veer from its traditional uh, mission. So we'll see where the commission lands on climate in particular and on other rulemakings that it may initiate on a going forward basis. But I think there's a bigger picture aspect to this than even just the, the proposal that the SEC has so far advanced. The one last point I would, I would make on it is when it comes to climate in particular, one question is, does climate risk need to be addressed? A separate question is, which part or parts of government ought to be the ones addressing it? I do think that aspect to it is, is present as well and is an important point. Just because something needs to be addressed, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's within the scope of the SEC or, or others for that matter, depending upon what it is, to be the ones who take up that particular objective. Look, uh, oh, sorry, are we out of scope, Commissioner Pivamore? Yeah, I mean, so Troy brings up some some excellent points here, right? And I think sort of unspoken is this um, major questions doctrine that has now been brought down by the Supreme Court, you know, under, you know, West Virginia versus EPA. To Troy's point that, you know, maybe there is government authority somewhere to address something. But the question is, is this particular agency, is it within the scope of their statutory authority? And you know, before major questions doctrine, right? We you know we still have Chevron deference, right? If the statute's ambiguous, and you can sort of you know think about that, you know, sort of tie goes to the agency. With major questions doctrine, effectively tie goes to the plaintiff on this. And so there's, if you look at some of the potential challenges to this rule, right? So traditionally they had sort of been the the, the two big ones that people had been predicting: uh, materiality, which Troy discussed uh, very well. The second one was in cost benefit analysis. Um, and um, the fact that you know the the SEC's um, you know estimates of costs are laughably low, and people are drawing analogies to Sarbanes Oxley and how the SEC's original cost analysis were were very very low. And then um, you know the the newest one is this major questions doctrine coming down, and does the SEC actually have the SEC or SEC, have the statutory authority, or does that reside elsewhere, or does Congress have to step in? Um, you know, Troy brought up the the politicization of um, of uh, you know SEC disclosures. You know, unfortunately, we've seen that in the past. In in Dodd Frank, we have a number of provisions that were put in, literally called miscellaneous provisions, because they were thrown in at the last minute of Dodd Frank, which required SEC to adopt rules for disclosures of resource extraction, conflict minerals, and mine safety, and that really politicized the agencies, but at least those were actual 
statutory authorities granted by Congress. There was no such granting of any authority within the climate risk realm. So I think that there's real risk um, that any that that the SEC trying to move forward in this space um, that is going to get overturned by the courts. So Commissioner Atkins, your views. Oh, sorry, I'm uh, muted there. But uh, yeah, well, I, I agree with uh, what's being said. And uh, about a year or so ago, um, during the comment period, um, I signed on to a letter uh, with Harvey Pitt and Richard Breeden and uh, Phil Lochner, Rick Roberts, uh, where we raised these issues and we said that the commission didn't have the authority and um, and that also the standard should be materiality and what they've articulated in their proposal doesn't pass the laugh test, frankly, that um, all of this stuff, as Hester Peirce puts it, um, turning the SEC from from the Securities Exchange Commission into the Securities and Environmental uh, Commission. I think, uh, you know, it's just a way of reaching. And it, it will basically at any point in time, uh, you know, depend on what three non-elected, unaccountable people on this commission decide what they think is material. And um, so, so I think that's not what material is about. That's not what the Supreme Court has articulated going all the way back to 1976 when um, Thurgood Marshall uh, spoke for the court in uh, TSC Industries versus Northway. So all of that is still, I think, uh, the law of the land, uh, regardless of what this commission might think. So hopefully they will step back from the brink um, of approving this, because if not, then, I mean, it's the the most, most breathtaking um, bit about the proposal is really the hijacking of financial reporting. And unfortunately, the accounting profession has been talking its own book and sort of salivating over the prospect of, uh, you know, diving into all this. So that's unfortunate and sort of shame on them for not standing up for, uh, you know, the integrity of, um, of uh, financial reporting and, uh, and gap. So and unfortunately, just because the Europeans are, you know, doing what they're doing doesn't mean that we should do it here in the United States. Obviously, there'll be issues down the road for multinational companies, but we'll have to solve those um, when they come. So anyway, I think, uh, you know, this uh, just, uh, you know, for, for all those reasons, I don't see how, if this rule will be finalized, that it would be, um, you know, withstand a scrutiny down the road. And finally, uh, last word on this point, uh, Commissioner Gallagher. I have nothing to add to the substance. My my colleagues have nailed it, uh, but it just reminds me of a, a funny little story. One of these three former commissioners spoke at my farewell party when I left uh, trading and markets. And when he uh, came up to the podium, this was in 2010, he said, it's so great to be back here at the Environmental Protection Agency. And they said, oh, I mean, SEC. And it, it brought down the house because it was right after uh, the commission's climate guidance, I think, had come out uh, a few months before that. So the more things change, the more they stay the same. <laughs> Remember that, Paul? <laughs> the best part was the chairman was standing right there, too. So anyway. All right, Teresa. Thanks. You know, that's so funny because Chairman Pitt also calls it, you know, the EPA the, <laughs> was also also using that. But that's so funny. Um, OK, well, let's kick it over for a speed round of cyber. Yeah, speed round for cybersecurity, given we're running up against time. Um, we want to focus on the cyber rules the SEC proposed last year on the disclosure of material cyber incidents and cybersecurity practices for public companies. The proposed rules would add a new item to Form 8K and require disclosure of material cybersecurity incidents within four business days of determining that an event is material and to require periodic reporting of updates about previously reported cybersecurity incidents. This proposal has raised a lot of concerns from public companies and those in the incident response world because the disclosures may be required before an issuer has been able to complete its investigation of the matter. And it it's also cannot be delayed to facilitate an investigation by law enforcement or the company's remedial efforts. Um, commissioners, I wonder in a speed round, um, what do you see as the pros and cons of this proposed rule? And maybe start off with uh, Commissioner uh, Pivovar. 
Sure. So, I mean, this is one that, I mean, this is one that we're public companies and banks have been struggling with this. On the one hand, they have regulatory obligations to report this stuff. On the other hand, Jonathan, as you pointed out, a lot of times law enforcement agencies are saying, please stay quiet on this. We don't want you to make this public yet while we do our investigation. Um, you know, this is one where I think um, the Treasury Department could play a pivotal role in helping to resolve this. There's something called FIBIC, which is the Federal Banking Infrastructure something, I forget. It's one of those acronyms and only exists in Washington, D.C. But it's a, it's a group of, um, of regulators, uh, banking regulators, credit unions, housing, um, you know, the SEC, um, chaired by the Assistant Secretary for Financial Institutions, the Treasury Department, that look at things like cybersecurity, how to coordinate responses across the federal government. This is not unique to the SEC. In this case, they've put out a rule for public companies, but I think this is one where um, if folks are looking for relief or for, for um, you know, the redress to their government, I think they, they should go to the uh, Treasury Department here. And Commissioner Paredes, what do you think? I'll be very, very brief. I think one of the one of the general takeaways is that disclosure isn't necessarily without its own costs. And I think thinking about what the full set of implications are, and in the context of cyber, there's a unique a unique set of potential implications. I think has to be part of the overall cost benefit assessment. And I think it's a, to to Mike's point. I think it's uh, an area where other parts of the government certainly have a lot to contribute in terms of um, how the SEC approaches ultimately trying to strike that right balance. Commissioner Gallagher. Yeah, I, this is just completely uh, useless. In, in, I mean, the, the rules on the books apply. They're hard enough. And, and you know, speaking from the real world, not the, uh, you know, uh, philosophical world of the 10th floor of the SEC, it's hard enough to process all this stuff with a four-day arbitrary timeline sitting on it. You, you are going to get a less vibrant disclosure. You're going to cut off to Mike's point law enforcement efforts. Um, there's going to be a conflict among, you know, between the uh, the disclosure requirement and, and the best efforts of law enforcement. I, I just, this is one of those Monday morning quarterback things where you're like, what's, what's the deficiency? Where's the problem right now? There are existing rules that apply. Believe me, when you're a public company and you have a breach, you feel the gun to your head as you go through this process. And the disclosure decision is so incredibly important. To Troy's point, it's, there is a cost to it. And you got to get it right. And you don't want to screw your shareholders because you put out sloppy disclosure just to meet a, a, an arbitrary four-day deadline. This reminds me a lot of the reg side debates we had about like who has more skin in the game? The SEC, who, by the way, gets hacked all the time, or you know, uh, a, a private market participant. I, I think I'll choose the latter. Commissioner Atkins? Yeah, I don't have uh, much more to add, although that I, I can say from, you know, our clientele's, my firm's clientele uh, perspective, you know, this is one thing that keeps people up at night all the time. And it's not that uh, people are shirking, um, you know, their responsibilities are not taking the threat seriously. Lots of money and, and time is being spent to try to shore up defenses. But the government here, you know, especially with state agents out there on the other side, uh, who are you know trying doing the hacking and and whatnot? Uh, you know the government uh, you know is a vital force here and has to you know help uh, the private sector um, you know figure out how to how to stay apprised and you know up to date and, and uh, uh, reinforce their defenses. So I'm I I've heard through the grapevine that uh, other government agencies have gone to the SEC to um, you know talk about this and maybe talk them off the ledge, um, and so uh, you know. Maybe which explains why this has been out there for a while um, as a proposal. So may it just rest there. And there are lots of proposals that have uh, kind of died, uh, especially in Dan Gallagher's old uh, division out of there <laughs> over the years uh, for lack of attention. And so, um, you know, maybe this one will be the same. I think, uh, like uh, Dan was saying, there uh, the rules on the books you know, require disclosure uh, for you know, material events, things like that. People struggle with that. They also want to collaborate with the authorities to make sure that uh, you know the perpetrators can be caught. Um, so it's a very very fine line, and I'm not sure that this rule would advance um, you know that relationship at all. Well, thank you very much. Those are all great comments, and I'm going to turn it over to Jimmy to talk about uh, the future of administrative proceedings. 
Right. So we could probably have a separate panel just talking about this, especially with with the firepower that we have here. But we're going to kind of focus in on a few things. So in April in Axon Enterprises, the, the Supreme Court resolved a circuit split and held that district courts now have or perhaps always had the jurisdiction to hear collateral constitutional challenges to the administrative process and that litigants in the administrative process would not be forced to exhaust their administrative remedy uh, before they could seek uh, you know article three judicial review um, and so you know that's presumably for the administrative proceedings that you know weren't recently dismissed or that still remain um, we're already seeing you know constitutional challenges being made to the district court um, and you know perhaps most recently the supreme court just granted cert to jarcacy v sec where the fifth circuit vacated um, a decision by the sec that Jarkasi and his investment advisor have committed securities fraud, kind of reaching very key critical constitutional issues, holding that you know the administrative forum denied the petitioners the right uh, to a jury trial, um, and that Congress unconstitutionally delegated legislative power to the SEC, in particular allowing the SEC to pick which forum it chooses to litigate its enforcement actions, federal court or the administrative process. And lastly, um, it also took on and held the statutory removal restrictions over SEC LJs violate Article 2. Um, so, you know, in the time we have left here, uh, you know, what, what are your thoughts? If you had a crystal ball, what do you what would you say about the future of, you know, administrative proceedings? And Commissioner Gallagher, I'll start with you. Look, I think, um, you know, it's kind of in some ways it's regrettable, I guess not if you love the constitution, but it, 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 it's regrettable that, uh, that the agency got itself into this posture. Mike and I used to talk about this all the time when we were on the commission together and same, same with Troy, when we were together, uh, you know, Dodd-Frank did many weird things and does many weird things, current tense, um, you know, it opening up the floodgates to the use of the ALJ system was misplaced, misguided. I think it didn't necessarily need to be run with uh the way it was uh for years right then and we saw it um you know troy and mike and i saw it kind of trickle and then become more of a flow and it was kind of predictable that this was going to happen uh, mike and i always talk about um our little note we put in our statement regarding lucia that you know th th there's there's bad cases and bad facts sometimes and you can think somebody was you know culpable or not uh but on the the con law issues you know, the commission's not some expert agency, right? They're, they should be the ones weighing in on con law issues. And unfortunately, uh, the agency put itself into a posture where the courts decided all the way up to the Supreme Court and there's loss after loss after loss, right? And, and now you have even FINRA, uh, you know, being called out by the DC circuit for potentially running an unconstitutional um, adjudicatory program. So this is, you know, when the agency gets out of whack Right. When we it goes all the way back to your SEC speaks discussion where where like passions and politics aren't tempered and people want to continually push the envelope. This is what happens. Right. That, the, you know, the courts will come in, coming in on the crypto side now. Uh, you know, they come in on uh, the ALJ side. You know, they're now FINRA, as I mentioned, all because of excessiveness, I would say. And, you know, it'd be interesting to hear. Paul's take, I think when, you know, when I worked for Paul, when he was a commissioner, you know, there weren't that many complaints about ALJs, right? Because the agency was staying in its lane, it was registered people, and there were still complaints, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't some burning issue, right? And and the notion that that somebody lobbied Congress, some gadfly group lobbied Congress to open up ALJs and then put the agency in peril because, you know, political types couldn't resist using it. It's just a shame. So. Um, so look, I, I, I never, you know, relish in rooting against the agency, but so I'm not going to do that. I'll just root for the constitution here. Commissioner sure. Atkins. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Sorry. No, you know, so, okay. Well, anyway, so, all right. I'm happy to, to chime in here, but just briefly, I, I, uh, similar to what Dan was saying, I think that, uh, when you look at, uh, you know, how things have morphed in, a, in particular after Dodd-Frank and then, you know, uh, a more aggressive, well, in a way, it's not that in the old days enforcement wasn't aggressive, but uh, just uh, uh, 
uh, I think uh, there's a perception out there that the SEC is, you know, choosing the venue much more carefully and in order to try to uh, gain, um, you know, a good, uh, you know, result. Uh, and even back, if you remember, with Gupta, who was the former McKinsey a partner who was, I can't remember what she was a director. I, I don't remember the facts, but anyway, uh, yeah, the first SEC went after him, you know, with an administrative proceeding and he wasn't a registered person or anything. Um, so that was, you know, one of the, it was going to be a new use of the uh, um, uh, Dodd-Frank uh, powers. And Troy, I think you were on the commission at the time. So maybe you remember this, but anyway, that, but that, was one of the first uh, uh, things there where I think people started to think, well, this is now stretched, uh, you know, more than um, obviously more than it traditionally was. So, um, uh, you know, if you look at the, all the way back to what the Constitution, what uh, why it was uh, um, put together the way it was, and uh, in reaction to the Privy Chamber and all the other things that were going on behind the scenes in uh, in Britain, as far as uh, taking away people's uh, uh, rights and liberties, uh, you know, this is why we have Article Three judges and and the whole um, the whole. Um, process there of approval. So I think, uh, you know, this is going to be pared back uh, by this current court and the the past cases that have gone up there, you know, have been a warning, um, I think, as to uh, how, the, you know, a huge majority of the court um, approaches these uh, cases and, and is troubled by the situation. Commissioner Pumar, sorry, I cut you off. Yeah, yeah no, it was, um, I mean, I, I totally agree with Paul. I think I think it is going to get pared back. And to Dan's point, we saw an overly aggressive use of administrative proceedings when we were there. It wasn't really announced. It was just the head of enforcement at the time just started bringing more and more cases. And it got to the point where we were actually, um, you know, uh, dissenting on actually authorizing cases simply because of venue selection. We thought it was not appropriate for various cases. It makes, you know, one could argue that it kind of makes sense to have judges there for regulated entities and very complex cases and certain remedies and all that sort of stuff. Um, but even then, right, when I came in, it, it's, it's an odd structure where the commission authorizes the case, it gets heard before an ALJ, and then when it, if it comes back on appeal by either the enforcement division or the respondent, it, it comes back on appeal to the commission. And we do these weird things where we, we, we have people in the rulemaking divisions who don't work on enforcement cases because if it comes back on appeal, you don't want anybody tainted by the fact that they've worked on the enforcement case because enforcement is a, you know, a party in the case at the appeal. But the same commissioners who authorize the case in some cases are also the same commissioners voting on appeals. And we also have this, the same councils oftentimes work on the cases. And I remember having this odd conversation with our appellate staff where they asked me, you know, where, what, what was my thinking going into the case? And I said, well, were there any facts that came out in the proceeding that we weren't privy to when we authorized it? And they said, no. And I said, that's what I thought, you know, reading the LJ's decision there. And I said, well, I was comfortable authorizing the case. So, I'm, you know, I'm still comfortable moving forward. And they said, well, actually, you know, the old you, you is supposed to be walled off from the new you. You're supposed to look at this case anew. And I just thought, you know, these weird contortions, you know, to Dan's point about the Constitution here. I mean, it's just, it's very, very weird. And, and we've, we've been doing this, Dan and I have been having this little private text chat back and forth, like a kind of an I told you so. Dan mentioned the Lucia case. That was one. Our dissent is up there on the website. It was bad facts and sort of bad law in the case. And, and, and the issue was brought up about the constitutionality. I can't remember if it was the appointment clause or, or establishment clause. And the majority of the commission wanted to weigh in and say, yeah, it is absolutely constitutional. We just felt it was not appropriate to Dan's point for the commission to weigh in on this. So we put in our, uh, in our dissent that we look forward to Article Three federal judges um, you know, resolving this issue going forward. You know, this was in 2015. Literally, literally, you know, little did we know it would take eight years for this to actually work its way through the court, and and another at least a year, another term going forward. So, um, look forward to, to to the Supreme Court taking up this case. Mike, Mike, you remember? Even worse, I was told, and I'm not going to say who said it. I was told that there was an expectation of Chevron deference on the commission's position on the Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it's it's i mean it's funny we you know we had multiple cases and we just kept pointing people to that and they're like well the sec keeps bringing them so 
Um, you know, it took it's taking eight years and maybe one more Supreme Court term for us to be proven right yet again. Commissioner Paredes, any thoughts? I would just say that in addition to the kind of focus on ALJ specifically, including now with the right to jury trial um, aspect being um, something that the Supreme Court is going to consider, I think there's a broader aspect to it as well, which is what's going on in terms of the courts. In many instances, I think, at least to some degree, growing questions or skepticism of the shape and size and power of the administrative state generally. Right? I, I, I think there's, there's, there's the specifics of the ALJ stuff, but I do think, again, that that's part of a broader development across, across the courts. I think, I think major questions, as Mike was saying before, is part of that. Certainly, APA has been part of that for some time. You got the court taking up uh, Chevron, we'll see where the court uh, lands and then what the consequences are of wherever the court lands. But the administrative state has grown considerably just as a general proposition. The SEC is no, uh, is no exception. And when you take a step back and stop and kind of pause on that, um, I do think it's part of what is the undercurrent across a lot of cases and developments that otherwise may look like they're their own thing. But when you um, elevate to a sufficient level of generality, I think there is that commonality across them of some degree of growing skepticism, hesitancy, unease by many um, in the judiciary about where the administrate, administrative state uh, as a general matter has gotten to. I actually think that that question of the administrative state, beyond ALJs, but ALJs and even the SEC, of the administrative state I think is a very, very significant um, development to keep an eye on for the next decade. Thank you so much, commissioners. It is really an honor and a, and a joy to be able to discuss all of these topics with just any one of you, but collectively together um, is, is a lot of fun and very educational and insightful. Um, so thank you very much. And I think with our remaining time here, um, we just want to take some a few moments to honor Chairman Harvey Pitt, uh, his life and his distinguished career. Um, so while no bio would really do justice to the man that he, he is, um, I will try and give a brief uh, background. So Chairman Pitt was a lion of the securities bar. He truly loved the SEC and was larger than life. He was born in Brooklyn, New York. He was the son of a seamstress and a butcher, and he gra graduated from Stuyvesant High School at the age of 16. And then he graduated from Brooklyn College with a bachelor's degree and St. John's School of Law with a Juris Doctor. Chairman Pitt served at the SEC from 1968 until 1978, including three years as the commission's general counsel and the commission's youngest general counsel at the age of 30. Then for nearly a quarter of a century, Chairman Pitt was a senior corporate partner in the international law firm Freed Frank Harris Shriver and Jacobson. He was also a founding trustee and the first president of the SEC Historical Society and participated in a wide variety of bar and continuing legal education activities to further public consideration of significant corporate and securities laws issues. Chairman Pitt served as an adjunct professor at the, of law at Georgetown University Law Center, at George Washington University School of Law, and the University of Pennsylvania School of Law. He fulfilled his lifelong dream of serving as the SEC chairman from August 2001 to February 2003. And in that capacity, he was responsible for overseeing the SEC's response to market disruptions resulting from the terrorist attacks of 9-11, creating the SEC's real-time enforcement program, and leading the commission's adoption of dozens of rules in response to the corporate and accounting crises. He then launched his global business consulting firm, Calorama Partners, and continued notable work in corporate governance and capital markets, frequently called on as an expert witness, including for the Securities and Exchange Commission. Chairman Pitt was awarded the William O. Douglas Award in 2011, and he always made himself available to offer advice, submit SEC comment letters, give television interviews. And while his personal life is incredibly distinguished, his family was the most important to him, and he would often marvel at his wife, Sari, and he loved to proudly talk about his children and grandchildren. So with that, commissioners, we'd love to hear any remarks you'd like to share about Chairman Pitt. And Commissioner Atkins, you were on the commission with him, so we thought we'd start with you. Well, thanks, Teresa. Well, yeah, it's I uh, you know thought Harvard was great. I really 
miss him. I'm sorry that he's not uh, here today. Um, but he really, uh, you know, as you said, a lion of uh, the bar and was a good leader. And especially that was, uh, as you mentioned there, 9 11. Uh, you know, I was uh, waiting um, you know, sort of to be um, uh, nominated and then uh, confirmed uh, during and after that point. But um, he, uh, you know, he really led uh, the, um, uh, you know, the SEC uh, in, a, in a real, you know, hands-on way, 24-7, uh, like he sort of inimical, you know, that, his way of doing it and sending, uh, you know, emails and whatnot at all hours of the day and night. And, but uh, anyway, but really working with uh, the securities markets and the um, exchanges and whatnot to uh, give them the time that they needed not to reopen precipitously, um, and then uh, uh, you know give them uh, the relief that they needed to to get up and going. So I thought that was just really um, wonderful, and so it was a pleasure to have uh, worked with him, uh, and uh, he was such a thoughtful person. And if you think back on, I guess all of us here on the uh, on the screen, uh, the commissioners, uh, back to uh, the way closed meetings. I only hear about the way they are now, but. Uh, um, the way they used to be, where one would actually really ask questions about the case and go into it, and we would have, uh, you know, discussions about formal orders to, uh, you know, give direction to the staff who actually, you know, wanted to, in, in most cases, wanted to, um, you know, hear about it and then have interaction. And so um, those were days when you had a very thoughtful uh, commission, and uh, and I'm uh, proud to say that RV uh, led that. Thank you so much, Commissioner Gallagher. Oh, thanks, Teresa. Yeah, I um, I, I uh, got to know Harvey. We all knew of him. Uh, if you were a young securities lawyer like I was in the mid '90s or mid to late '90s, uh, um, you know, my first interaction personally with Harvey, I, I was carrying either Bill McLucas's or Harry Weiss's briefcase into a meeting um, where we had a, a joint client, a meeting with the staff. And I just remember Harvey, literally larger than life, Harvey rolls in with two associates and all these binders. And I mean, just a, a real production about anything he did. And then, you know, the the brilliance of what he said in the meeting, you just kind of sit back in awe um, at his intellect. And you know, so it was always in, in all of him, got to know him a little better when I worked uh, for Paul and, you know, that kind of picked up over time. Uh, but, you know, having just been at his funeral, listening to his family talk about the notes he left, um, it was really fascinating to me because I, I was thinking, yeah, I, that, that, I have a connection to that. I'm going to go home this weekend and actually look at some of my old emails that I had from Harvey. And it was so amazing. It was a little overwhelming, actually. It made me a bit emotional. But each message, you know, had some sort of heartfelt, uplifting note to you that was very personal to you. It wasn't contrived. It wasn't, you know, he thought about it and he, you know, whether it was five paragraphs or one, it was just always so special and he made you feel special. Um, and, you know, I, it was always an honor to me just to be associated with him. And, you know, I I still owe him probably quite literally if he, if he charged me billable hours when I got into my spat with Harvard, I probably would owe him $10 million. But, uh, you know, he he decided to intellectually take on that cause. And I think he had fun, quite frankly. I was a, uh, you know, a needy friend. And um, but it's always a friend indeed. So I I miss him already. I know you do, uh, Teresa, more than uh, more than anybody. But, uh, you know, I'm just proud to have known him. And, you know, we got to keep his memory alive. No, thank you so much. And I did the same thing with my emails. I've spent hours and hours going through old emails and it was, it was, a, it was really warm, you know, heartwarming. So, yeah. Um, Commissioner Paredes. One of the things I, I think, I think Dan's point about you, you knew of Harvey even before you knew Harvey, I think is really a testament uh, to Harvey and the impact he had on securities regulation. And I, I'm sure that's certainly my experience and I'm sure probably for everybody um, here um, as well. And then the opportunity to get to know him. One of the things is, you know, sometimes you expect somebody of his stature and, uh, and accomplishment and kind of knowledge expertise to, I don't know, maybe let, let's just say be, be different than Harvey really was as a person, but he was, he was a really good person and supportive uh, and generous and interested, and you, that, that was immediate. 
um, I think the first time, you know, that I had interactions with him that, you know, came across and, and it didn't need to, right. He didn't need to be that way. I think that's just who he, you know, was as a human being. And, and I think that is, is among the most memorable aspects of having gotten the benefit of getting to know and become friends um, with him beyond, you know, the four corners of his expertise when it comes to the SEC and the federal um, securities laws. The, the other thing I, I would note, and, and Teresa, you, you made reference to this in your um, remarks, boy, you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who had more admiration for the SEC. And, you know, you, you could have that admiration without necessarily agreeing with every single thing the SEC does or doesn't do at any particular moment in time. It's, it's having that admiration regardless of whether or not, you know, you agree at any particular moment in time with any particular decision that's coming out of the agency. And his admiration, reverence, um, I would say, for the commission um, was unshakable. And that's a huge testament to, to him. And I think of the importance of folks like Harvey and given his years of commitment to the SEC. And I would say his commitment to the SEC was not only when he was there, whether it was on the staff as general counsel or, or as the chair uh, of the SEC, but he was committed to the SEC even when he wasn't there at the commission, but he was in you know, its orbit in terms of his private practice. So um, you know, an incredibly consequential person in the history of uh, of the agency, and I know we all uh, miss him a ton. Thanks, Commissioner Paredes. Commissioner Pivovar. Yeah, I mean, a lot's already been said, right? I mean, Harvey just didn't love the SEC. He loved the SEC, <laughs> right? And to Troy's point, you know, when sometimes the SEC would go through, you know, some criticisms, um, and, and Harvey would be the first one on television uh, defending the institution, and the great people that work there, you know, regardless of whether he agreed with particular policy decisions. I mean, he was just loved the institution and loved the people there. Um, you know, I came to the SEC as a staff economist first in the early 2000s when, uh, when Harvey was chairman. And I remember the first interaction with him, he was walking around talking about PUCA. And I'm like, what the heck is that? And it turned out that there was, it was the Public Utility Holding Company Act that had granted authority to the SEC back it was a new deal thing it was this weird thing and and people used to call it puka but Harvey had so much disdain for it he called it puka <laughs> and he would go around and, and he was you know convincing Congress to repeal that authority because it just no longer made sense and um, was very very effective in doing that um, you know I came in as a staff you know a visiting academic and a staff economist and I you know I thought Harvey was just sort of you know, like like any other chairman and, and valued the role of economic analysis at, at the SEC, right? The SEC is mostly lawyers um, and, you know, a small group of economists that were there. And he really valued um, the role that we had in the rulemaking uh, framework and cost benefit analysis and also the enforcement cases. Um, little did I learn that he was the exception, not the rule. Um, and you know, after he left, the SEC lost a number of cases because subsequent chairmen did not take into account um, the fact that the SEC, in accordance with the, you know, the, the Administrative Procedure Act, has to do adequate cost-benefit analysis. So he was proven right on that. Um, and then, you know, when, when, when I was nominated to be a commissioner, when it first became public, Harvey was literally the first person who reached out. Um, and, and just like Dan, um, I went back and look at the emails and, and none of the heartfelt, but I almost teared. I mean, I started tearing up actually the big blue font in the email <laughs> that he was then that he was just very famous for. It was almost like this bold, big, you know, larger than life font, the way that, Her that, that Harvey was, you know, larger than life too. And so um, I will always appreciate it. Of course, you know, every, a lot of folks reached out, but Harvey was literally the first one and, and I will always appreciate that. Yeah, the Arial BT blue font. I'm well familiar. <laughs> so thank you so much. And um, so I'll just say a, a few words too, because you know I did have the good fortune of working with with Chairman Pitt, and he was um, he was my professional and personal mentor and, and father. And so I learned a lot from his brilliance and judgment and just institutional knowledge. It's um, even though I worked at the SEC, it really wasn't until afterwards that I got such an 
such an affection for it. I think a lot through all of his institutional knowledge, hearing all of the stories from the 70s and then his historical knowledge from going back to the 30s when it was the FTC before the SEC and all sorts of things. But um, I, I learned a lot from him. And it, like I said, it was through his eyes that I really had a, a gain an affection for the SEC, Chairman Ray Garrett Jr., Brooklyn, the movies. Um, for those of you, you know, at, who, who have heard Harvey say that all, all good advice comes from the, from the movies, but, um, he really inspired me and I thought I'd share something about how magnanimous and generous he is, is, is kind of the story of how I met him. Cause I was in the office of general counsel and I cold called him and said, hi, you know, I left a message. I'm, I'm in OGC and I'm being investigated by the officer of inspector general. And I thought, I was wondering if you might help me. And I got a call back right away. I was in and off at his office and he defended me pro bono, completely exonerated me, offered me to come work with him and then shed a light on everything that was going on in the IG's office at that time. And then we defended people pro bono. And, and ever since then, he's just been a really um, instrumental and, and huge part of my life. So, um, and he loved to be a mentor. Uh, so, uh, I think of him as is one of the most brilliant, funny, magnanimous, and generous persons I've ever met. Um, and his family too. He's a very generous um, and gracious family. So it goes without saying that he is already deeply missed by many people. Okay, and I think that just takes us to our disclosure. Thanks everybody for coming in. Thanks for the the, the great uh, uh, back and forth on uh, hot legal topics and for honoring Chairman Pitt. Um, as always, comments heard on bulls, bears, and blockchain are for informational purposes only. Do not constitute legal advice. Uh, the opinions expressed on today's program are those of the participants and not of any entity. And again, if any questions, uh, any questions for any of us, you can find us our bios and our emails at bakerlaw.com. And uh, so for John Carney, Teresa Goody, Jimmy Focus, and John Barr, uh, Michelle Tanney, and Veronica Reynolds from Baker. I want to thank the uh, the commissioners for taking the time for a truly extraordinary program. Teresa, thank thanks. thanks everyone. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.